sweet. All right, yeah. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us for this really exciting webinar. I know a lot of folks were anticipating this webinar after we announced it last week, and so I'm really excited to have everyone here with us. Uh, this webinar will be focused on climate change to COVID, how to combat misinformation. My name is Samantha Parsons, and I'm the campaigns director with Uncoke My Campus. Also on the call, we have our executive director, Jasmine Banks, Tempest Tuggle, our operations manager, Mo Banks, our digital communications associate, and Avital Nathman, our media coordinator. Jazz, do you want to say a few words before I keep rolling? Yeah, I just want to welcome everyone. We know that um, in this moment in history, lots of us are experiencing um, just completely unprecedented uh, circumstances, and we know that our work also continues during this time because our opposition doesn't rest. And so I'm really grateful for everyone attending today and looking for real, tangible, measurable ways to make an impact. And um, just want to give my gratitude to John for his brilliance and skill and talent. And um, I hope that y'all will follow his work in addition to supporting UNCOPE in the future. So thank you and I'm, I'm grateful you're all here. Thanks, Jasmine. And on that note, I will introduce our facilitator for our workshop today. Uh, that is Dr. John Cook. John is a research assistant professor at the Center for Climate Change Communication at Georgia University. He obtained his PhD at the University of Western Australia, studying the cognitive psychology of climate science denial. His research focus is understanding and countering misinformation about climate change. In 2007, John founded Skeptical Science, a website which won the 2011 Australian Museum Eureka Prize for the Advancement of Climate Change Knowledge and the 2016 Friend of the Planet Award from the National Center for Science Education. John authored the book Cranky Uncle versus Climate Change, which I'm pretty sure is now an app as well, which is really cool that combines climate science, critical thinking, and cartoons to explain and counter climate misinformation. If you follow on Coco on Instagram, I'm sure you've seen some of John's work in our stories. And in 2013, John published a paper finding 97% scientific consensus on human cause global warming, a finding that has been highlighted by President Obama and UK Prime Minister David Cameron. And so I really just don't think we could have someone who is more of an expert on this topic to be joining us today and talking about combating climate change denial and myths surrounding COVID-19. Um, I also want to make a note before we hop in that I don't, I don't see them on yet, but if they do join, there is a film director that has expressed interest in capturing some content from this webinar, which is really exciting. Um, this director is working on a documentary about the influence of lobby groups and dark money organizations on U.S. politics, and their film will be looking at how the Koch brothers have been organizing um, influence in both politics and universities to stop action on climate change here in the United States, and how that interrelates to act, taking action on climate change as a global community, which is super cool that they want to feature on Koch and our analysis and the work that we do in higher education. Um, obviously, the director wanted to film an in-person event <laughs> that Uncoke wanted to do, uh, but COVID-19 has put a lot of those in-person events on hold, and so now they're just trying to pivot and find ways to capture content virtually. With that being said, the director has agreed to make sure that anyone who does not want their face potentially, like if, if they capture something of us speaking or of you speaking and you don't want your face featured in a documentary, um, we will be sure to blur that out or take that section out of the documentary. But if you're, and so we'll do that follow up, we'll like work with people based on what they decide to use to make sure everyone has, gives consent. But if you're really worried about your beautiful face being featured in a great documentary, you can also click the stop video button at the bottom of the screen to your left, um, just for a safe measure. All right, now that we've gotten all of those housekeeping items out of the way, I'm going to take about five more minutes of your time and just review a bit about what we've discussed so far, because this webinar is really the third webinar in a series about 
climate change denial and the interrelation of climate change denial and the myths being propagated about COVID-19. And so I'm going to share my screen and walk us through a little bit of a review there, and then I'll hand it over to John. Let's see. All right, can people see my screen and still hear me? Thumbs up. Sweet. All right, so two weeks ago, Dr. Gibson from Green PSA walked us through a great presentation talking about uh, the Koch Family Foundation and their climate denial machine. Connor informed us that the Koch Family Foundations have invested over a hundred in dozens of anti-climate organizations over the past few decades to push climate denial and push inaction on climate change. The, the Koch then leverages those dozens of organizations, whether they are educational institutions, policy think tanks, media outlets, or astroturf grassroots organizations to build a public a conversation amongst the public to cast doubt on the need and importance of climate action. And that doubt on the need and importance of climate action creates this public distrust around any efforts that, whether it's the state-based government or the, the federal government taking to drive regulation or um, limit our reliance on fossil fuels. And so this, this mainstreaming through the conversations that the public has because of the Koch Network's political infrastructure of universities, think tanks, media outlets, and uh, grassroots organizations then creates this, it empowers legislators, whether they're at the state or federal level, to, pa uh, to weaken regulations or not pass regulations that would help us better protect our environment or that would help us combat climate change, um, as well as it empowers judges to make rulings that are, that are in favor of corporations rather than people like ourselves. And then last week, we talked about how that same mechanism, that same energy, is actually being applied to um, weaken the public's trust and expectation in government interference around COVID-19. And so the same pol political infrastructure that the Koch Network has really set up to cast doubt on climate change is now being mobilized to cast that same type of doubt around the, the scientific evidence around COVID-19 and the need for social distancing and practices to protect our community. And that has really amplified in the past few weeks, protests to reopen uh, state governments and local governments despite advice from medical professionals. And so what we've learned through these conversations over the past few weeks is that the Koch Network has really created this infrastructure to help propagate and promote the transmission of these myths but along with the transmission of these myths around climate change and COVID comes the transmission of harm. So it prevents us from passing regulations that support um, protecting our environment, that allow our governments to take aggressive action to stop climate change. And it also harms us by um, perhaps reopening economies before we should be in terms of protecting our communities from COVID-19. And so really what we've been doing over the past month is really talking about how these ideas and how the Koch Network is propagating and promoting these ideas are resulting in the harm or significant harm to our communities. And what I'm, what I'm really excited about today is John is going to talk to us about how do we actually disrupt those myths? How can we as individual citizen activists, whether it's having dinner with our family, engaging on social media, or taking action collectively, disrupt the promotion of these myths and, and engage in protecting our communities from this infrastructure that the Koch Network has set up. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and pass it over to John to walk us through the workshop. Thanks, Sam. Um, hopefully my slides are coming up okay now. Great. Uh, all right. Well, thank you very much for the, the invitation to talk and and discuss my research. And I hope that this is interesting and also uh, useful to everyone attending. So I wanna talk about um, firstly, the parallels between climate 
denial and COVID-19 denial, and then um, transition from there to talking about how, how to respond. Because for the last decade, I've been researching how do we respond to climate misinformation? And because of the parallels between the two issues, um, I've now been taking those same techniques and applying it to COVID misinformation as well. Uh, and, and in fact, the, the principles, the best practices that I'm going to discuss really apply to any form of misinformation. So hopefully this can be broadly applicable to, to any kind of public engagement that you might be involved in where there's misinformation um, that you have to deal with. So I wanted to start by talking about the similarities between uh, COVID denial and climate denial. Let me just move the thumbnails to the side. Uh, and there are a number of ways that um, denial of either COVID-19 as a threat or social distancing measures, um, that, that kind of denial has a lot of similarities to climate change denial. Uh, and let me, uh, let me give you some examples. Firstly, as, uh, as Brendan and DSMOG blog discussed in the last webinar, which you can, you can watch the whole thing on, on Uncoke's YouTube channel, a lot of the same actors who have been promoting climate misinformation and promoting climate denial for the last decade or several decades are now active promoting um, either COVID-19 misinformation or casting doubt on social distancing measures and generally just um, applying all those same types of arguments that we've seen in the past uh, climate change and now using all those same techniques for, for COVID-19. Um, COVID Psychologically, um, there's um, research coming out now which is showing that the same drivers of climate denial are uh, either the same or very similar to um, people who are downplaying COVID-19. Now, there's been many, many studies, many surveys exploring people's attitudes about climate change and what are the drivers or predictors of those attitudes. And um, one of the best studies that summarize all the surveys, essentially a survey of surveys or meta-analysis was done by Matthew Hornsey. And he found that across all these different studies, political affiliation or basically who you vote for was the um, biggest predictor by far of people's attitudes about climate change. If you voted for a politically conservative party, you were much more likely to be doubtful or dismissive of climate science and political ideology being second biggest driver of climate attitudes. Now, a few weeks ago, I um, ran an experiment um, about debunking COVID misinformation. And we asked a lot of questions about these similar types of demographics. And we found similarly that uh, there was a strong relationship between political affiliation and people's attitudes about social distancing, as well as um, their knowledge of social distancing and their knowledge about um, COVID-19. Uh, and essentially what we found was the more politically conservative people were, the less supportive they were of social distancing measures. This was done like I think about three weeks ago. I imagine that if we ran exactly the same survey today, it would be an even stronger relationship because the issue has been getting more and more polarized over the last uh, month. We find that the relationship is even stronger between support for social distancing and individualism. So we had a series of different survey measures asking people about um, whether they thought that individuals should look after themselves versus whether society or communities should, should look after each other. And the stronger people's individualism or their sense that individual, individuals should look after themselves, um, the lower their support for social distancing. There was a very strong relationship between those two, two uh, measures. So we, we see similar drivers um, in, in both issues. We also see the same types of arguments. Dana Nucciatelli wrote an article in Yale Climate Communications uh, looking at how in climate denial, we've seen these stages of denial or these categories of climate misinformation over, um, over decades. And the, and the stages of denial are that 
it's not happening, it's not us, it's not bad, and, and eventually casting down on solutions, whether saying they're ineffective, they won't work, or it's too late, and we can't, we can't solve the problem. We're now seeing those same stages of denial with COVID-19. And um, yeah, so Dana did a great job of documenting just parallel um, arguments across, across the two issues. What I've been focused on is um, the rhetorical techniques used in misinformation. And again, we see that the same logical fallacies, the same denialist techniques that we've seen in climate denial uh, are also being used now in, in COVID-19 misinformation. And this is a theme I'll come back to for most of the rest of this presentation because it's my research has been focused on, well, how do we take that, um, that logic-based approach to misinformation and how do we use that to neutralize misinformation? And I'll, I'll explore that shortly. Um, but I wanted to, before I get into that, I wanted to talk about one subtle difference between um, climate attitudes and attitudes about COVID-19. Now, uh, the Yale um, team on climate communication and uh, my colleagues at Mason, at, um, at the Center for Climate Change Communication, we've been conducting these national surveys every two years, measuring people's attitudes about climate change. And we found that you can basically group people's attitudes about climate change into these six groups from alarmism, or no, sorry, from being alarmed about climate change all the way to being dismissive of climate change. And I think the most important thing to recognize about the data that we've collected on climate attitudes is that the majority of the public are on board with climate change. Um, uh, look, this is data that we are collected ourselves last year. We ran an experiment and we had four questions. Uh, you can basically group the six Americas with these four survey questions. And, and using those, we found that around 80% of the public are on board. They're either cautious, concerned or alarmed about climate change. So we took those four survey items. And a few weeks ago, when we ran our COVID experiment, we asked the exact four questions, but we just substituted climate change with COVID-19 to measure the six Americas on, on COVID-19. And this is what we found. Uh, and the, the, the difference between these two is that on climate change, around 80% of the public are on board, of, uh, are concerned, or, or at least uh, they accept that there's a problem from cautious to alarmed. Uh, on COVID-19, 94% of the public are uh, either cautious, concerned or alarmed um, about the problem. So there's a much higher degree of concern about COVID-19 than climate change. And uh, as somebody working in misinformation, I've seen this reflected in uh, just people's much lower tolerance to misinformation about climate change. Uh, now, I'm not talking about uh, the people who generate the misinformation. But the general public, um, they recognise that misinformation about COVID-19 um, is not only um, damaging like from an understanding point of view, it can actually cause people to behave in ways that endanger themselves and endanger their community. Um, misinformation can kill in this case. And so people recognising this danger uh, are much less tolerant of uh, COVID-19 misinformation. And we see this also in social media uh, platforms who are take, much more proactive in taking down misinformation about COVID-19 than, than they are about other issues like climate misinformation. Like just over the last 24 hours, and it was trending this morning on Twitter, the, the phrase conspiracy theory, because there was a conspiracy theory film on YouTube that, that uh, YouTube keep taking down uh, and then other people keep uploading uh, new copies of the film. So it's... It's a, it's a dynamic that we haven't seen um, before uh, in, in climate change. And I think that this dynamic is a reflection of the fact that um, our psychological distance with COVID-19 is much smaller than it is with climate change. What I mean by psychological distance is uh, people, even though like 80% of the public are on board with climate change, uh, there is a degree of psychological distance in that we 
we psychologically think that climate change is something that's either happening somewhere else or it's going to happen in the future or it's happening to other people, not us. Um, and, and that psychological distance does uh, cause people to be less concerned about the issue than they otherwise should be, which is why communicating that climate change is happening here and now is one of the most important messages that we do need to get out there in order to reduce that psychological distance. It's a lot easier to um, communicate the threat of COVID-19 because that psychological distance is much smaller. But I want to just draw your attention to the bottom right corner of um, this slide and that 1% circle, the 1% of people who are dismissive of COVID-19. Because when the media covers public attitudes about um, this issue, about social distancing, uh, this is the kind of thing that, that we're seeing on TV, that we're seeing on the news. Um, we're seeing, uh, you know, these shocking images of people storming um, state houses with, with assault rifles. We're seeing these protests, we're seeing these um, often quite offensive protest signs. But it's really important to remember that, that these people, this very loud mi minority, are only around 1% of the population. They're a very small fraction, but they're a very loud minority. And uh, that really points to, to how do we address misinformation, whether it's about climate change or COVID-19. The dynamic is the same. Uh, it's a very loud minority that have a, a disproportionate influence. And so the way that we address misinformation about these issues is by inoculating the rest of the public, the 90, the 94 percent, the, the vast majority of the public who aren't dismissive of the science. We need to inoculate them against the misinformation that's coming from this loud minority. And so there's a, there's a body of research into how to do this. Uh, and it comes from a branch of psychological research called inoculation theory. And this research is based on the idea that you can build resilience in the public, you can build resistance against misinformation by exposing people to a weakened form of misinformation. And there are um, basically three different ways that you can inoculate the public against misinformation. The first method is uh, called source-based inoculation. And this involves um, basically exposing the sources, the, the uh, misinformation uh, sources, um, either showing where they have vested interests, showing where they're discredited, where they're, where they're not credible sources of scientific information. And one of the best sources for this kind of inoculation is DSmogBlog. They document the, the key actors in, in both climate change and now COVID-19 misinformation. And, and show their background and show how they're not credible sources of information. The second uh, form of inoculation is fact-based inoculation. Basically, explain the science, explain the facts to people, uh, explain how the facts show that the misinformation is false. This is a pr an approach we take at skepticalscience.com where we explain, explain climate science, and our goal, our, our mission from the beginning when I founded Skeptical Science in 2007 was debunk climate misinformation with peer-reviewed science. It's about explaining the science, making it accessible, providing links to all the primary sources, and use the facts to show how misinformation is false. Now, the third type of inoculation, and this is what my research has been mostly focused on over the last, um, or five to 10 years is logic-based inoculation. And I've been putting a lot of this research into practice just over the last, um, I guess, half year uh, on a website, crankyuncle.com, where I take this logic-based uh, inoculation approach and apply it in different ways. And, and I'll give you some examples of how I apply it um, shortly. Now, the... Um, so I'm going to talk a, a bit more about logic-based inoculation because while it's, it's actually the least um, used form of inoculation and it's the least researched form of inoculation, 
that some of the research that we've been doing at George Mason, and that will actually be coming out, some of that research will be coming out over the next few weeks, uh, finds that it's actually one of the most effective ways of countering misinformation. And so this approach uh, is built on the foundation of a paper that I published back in 2018 with two critical thinking philosophers, Peter Allerton and David Kinkeed. And what we did in this research was we developed a flowchart or a step-by-step -step method for deconstructing and analyzing misinformation. And the purpose of this step-by-step -step approach was basically at the end of it to identify any reasoning fallacies, any denial techniques in misinformation. And then once you have those, you can use that information to inoculate people. And um, very briefly, it's, it's actually a much more detailed um, flowchart than this, but the, the gist of it is three steps. The first step is deconstructing any claim, any form of misinformation into an argument structure. And an argument structure involves starting assumptions or premises and a conclusion. So every argument has that form. It's all, all these assumptions leading to a conclusion. Once you have that argument structure, then you uh, go to step two, which is, is this argument logically valid? If all the premises are true, does it logically follow that the conclusion is true as well? And if it doesn't, if it's logically invalid, so if the conclusion doesn't follow from the premises, you need to add any unstated um, assumptions or any hidden premises to the argument in order to make it uh, logically valid. I'm going to give some examples shortly to make this a little less theoretical and, and philosophical sounding. Um, and once you have a logically valid argument, then you go to step three, which is look at all the premises and check whether all of them or any of them are true or not. And once you've gone through that step, it's a, it's a rigorous and systematic way of going through misinformation and finding um, the, the reasoning fallacies or the denial techniques in the argument. Um, so, so I use that technique where I'm trying to look at a claim, look at some misinformation and figure out exactly where it goes wrong. But it's also something you can do on the fly when you're just having a conversation with someone and they throw out an argument and you're trying to make sense of it, you're trying to make sense of it even with them um, and getting people to flesh out their arguments and trying to, I guess, get them to articulate all the assumptions behind it especially the unstated assumption, that, that's a, a key way to getting to the heart of their arguments and, and identifying any, any fallacies, if, if there are any in their claims. So uh, in terms of identifying um, any fallacies in the premises, I find a really useful framework is the techniques of science denial, summarized with the acronym FLIC. And over the last half decade, I've gradually been building a taxonomy or a whole landscape of different techniques of science denial. So Flick has really evolved into this, this kind of sprawling taxonomy. Uh, and in fact, it was just a few weeks ago that I added all those, that line of purple icons, which are uh, the seven traits of conspiratorial thinking. And then just this morning, we published an, um, a a guide to spotting COVID-19 conspiracy theories. And we took um, examples of conspiracy theories about COVID-19 and identified those seven traits um, of conspiratorial thinking. And the idea was basically uh, inoculating the public against the techniques of, of conspiracy theories. Uh, but but uh, Flick covers all the different techniques of denial, whether it's cherry picking or using fake experts, or all the different types of logical fallacies. And um, uh, so, yeah, so I, I kind of got ahead of myself there, but this morning we took those seven traits of conspiratorial thinking and, um, and published this guide. And in, in the bottom right corner, you can see the URL for downloading, downloading the guide. It's just a very short four pager. And it's from, the idea of it is familiarize people with the techniques of conspiracy theories as a way of inoculating them against conspiracy theories. So that when they see someone saying, hey, just saw this film Plandemic and it says this, or hey, I hear that um, um, the 
COVID-19 uh, virus might have been generated in a lab in Wuhan. Uh, you can identify the telltale red flags of conspiracy theories if you understand these different techniques. So I'm going to take this approach of, of deconstructing um, misinformation uh, and apply it to a couple of examples of climate misinformation as a way of just making it a bit more concrete. Now, the first misinformation I wanna look at is the Global Warming Petition Project. Um, some of my colleagues, uh, Sandra van der Linden and, and my boss, Ed Maybach, ran a study in 2017 where they tested six different forms of climate misinformation, basically six common myths uh, that climate deniers use. And this one was the most uh, effective in reducing support for climate action, reducing acceptance of climate change. Um, it's basically um, probably the most powerful climate myth out there. Uh, and so, um, so uh, when you, if you want to uh, take the critical thinking method and apply it to this, um, apply it to this myth, uh, the first step is uh, break it up into an argument structure. So the argument is basically that there's 31,000 science graduates who have signed a petition saying that humans aren't causing dis uh, humans aren't disrupting climate, uh, and therefore there mustn't be a scientific consensus on climate change. Now, if you, you look at this from an argument structure point of view, there's basically two assumptions or premises. The first is that a large proportion of science graduates are dissenting against human-caused global warming, and the second premise is that science graduates are experts on climate change. Now, if these two premises are true, does it logically follow that the conclusion is true, uh, that there's no consensus? Uh, and the answer is yes. If these two premises are true, then it would automatically follow that the conclusion is true as well. And so the final step is, are both these premises true? Uh, um, is, does a large proportion of science graduates dissent against uh, human caused global warming? And the answer is no. 31,000 is a tiny fraction of the uh, millions of science graduates in the US. And so it uses the technique of magnified minority. 31,000 sounds like a big number, but in the context of all graduates of a science degree, it's actually less, it's a fraction of a percent. And similarly, the second premise is false as well, because just because somebody has a degree in some field of science doesn't necessarily convey expertise in climate change. Uh, and in fact, nine, over 99% of the 31,000 signatories don't have any expertise in climate change research. And so by going through that three-step method, we see where this argument goes wrong. It misleads people by magnifying a, a minority and it uses fake experts to cast doubt on the expert consensus. All right, let's go to another myth about climate change. We keep hearing that 2014 has been the warmest year on record. I asked the chair, you know what this is? It's a snowball that just from outside here. So it's very, very cold out, very unseasonable. So they are trying to catch this. So this was um, in February 2015. Uh, so we just had the hottest year on record in 2014. Um, ironically, then 2015 beat that, and then 2016 beat 2015. So um, he was making the argument that global warming isn't happening in what ended up being the hottest year on record. And the reason why he says that global warming isn't happening is because it was cold outside. It was February in Washington, D.C., and there was snow on the, on the floor outside the, the building. Um, whoops, oops. There we go. all right. So, so the argument that it's cold, therefore global warming is happening, it um, basically has two premises. Um, it's cold somewhere and no place can experience cold if global warming is happening. And therefore the conclusion is that global warming isn't happening. And again, if both those premises are true, then yes, the conclusion is true but both those premises commit um, um, fallacies. The, the first one is cherry picking or spe a specific form of cherry picking, um, the anecdote fallacy. Uh, 
just looking at a specific example and um, generalizing that to, to well, the whole world in this case. Uh, and secondly, it commits, the, the second premise commits the fallacy of impossible expectations. Just because it's global warming doesn't mean that um, cold weather is going to exist, uh, is going to disappear. It doesn't mean that we don't stop having winter. It just means that cold uh, snaps are less likely and heat records are more likely. Uh, let's look at another example. Senator Rubio, the Miami mayor, has endorsed you. Will you honor his request for a pledge and acknowledge the reality of the scientific consensus of climate change and pledge to do something sure, about the it. climate is changing. And one of the reasons why the climate is changing is because the climate has always changed. There has never been a time when the climate has not changed. So Marco Rubio is arguing, arguing that climate has changed naturally in the past. So what's happening now must be natural as well. And uh, so this argument has two assumptions. Firstly, climate has changed naturally in the past and climate is changing now. Therefore, what's happening now must be natural. Now, this is a case where the argument is actually logically invalid. If both those premises are true, it doesn't necessarily follow that the conclusion um, is, is true as well. Just because uh, nature has caused climate change in the past doesn't necessarily mean that it must be causing it now. Uh, and so we need to add a third assumption, the hidden assumption, in order to make this logically valid. And the hidden assumption is that whatever drove climate change in the past must also be driving climate change now. And this assumption commit single cause fallacy, assuming that there's only one, one factor um, driving climate change. Uh, I think we've got one more example. Carbon dioxide is perfectly natural gas. It's just like water vapor. It's something that plants love. They grow better with more carbon dioxide. And you can see the greening of the earth already from uh, the additional carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Uh, so this is um, the argument that Plants need CO2 to grow, therefore we should be emitting lots of CO2 because that would be good for plants. And uh, basically this argument commits the fallacy of oversimplification. It, um, it focuses on one thing that plants need, which is CO2, they do need CO2 to grow, but it ignores other factors that plants need as well, such as they need a, um, a range of temperature in order to Flourish. If it gets too hot or too cold, plants suffer. They need a um, regular supply of water. If it's if there's either drought or flooding, that's harmful for plant growth as well. And climate change disrupts those two elements uh, by by introducing heat stress or flooding or drought into the system. That has negative impacts on plant growth. And so, just arguing that. Um, CO2 is plant food and therefore it's, it's good for plant growth uh, is an oversimplification that's not looking at the full picture. And so uh, that's what I've done is I guess given you a um, it's almost a theoretical look at how do you approach misinformation, how do you systematically uh, analyze it in order to find out where misinformation misleads. Uh, and then having done that the next question is well how do you put that into practice? How do you how do you uh, engage with the public or have a conversation with people or just respond to misinformation? And uh, this is a basic summary of the last 20 to 30 years of um, psychological research into debunking misinformation. And there are really three elements that you need to know in order to build an effective debunking of misinformation. Um, and those three elements are fact, myth, and fallacy. Uh, firstly, um, one of the most important elements to debunking is uh, communicating the facts. Um, and and it's, it's not just, um, like you need to be strategic in how you choose your facts and how you communicate them for two reasons. Firstly, because when you're um, debunking a myth, you're basically reaching into people's mental models and you're taking that myth out of their mental model. Um, and people don't like gaps in their mental models. If people believe that A causes B and B causes C, and you're telling people actually B is wrong, uh, and, and you're taking B out of their model, 
there's a gap suddenly and people don't like gaps. And so um, researchers have found that if you tell people that B is wrong and, and take it out, uh, because there's this gap in their model, the myth comes back and continues to influence them, which is why it's so hard to debunk misinformation. So you not only have to show them that the myth is wrong, you have to replace the myth with a factual replacement. Um, a fact that fits into their mental model and meets all those causal requirements that the original myth uh, did. So, for example, if um, if the myth is that the sun is causing global warming and you, sh and you explain the fact that, well, actually, over the last, um, you know, three or four decades of global warming, uh, the sun has been cooling. So it can't be proving, it can't be causing global warming. You've shown that the sun isn't causing it, but you need to also provide that um, causal replacement. What is causing global warming? And then ex also explain how we know that human greenhouse gas emissions are causing it. CO2 is driving global warming because it's a heat trapping gas and we're adding more of this heat trapping gas to the atmosphere. So um, you need to replace the myth with a, um, with a fact, a factual replacement. But you also uh, ideally need to communicate that fact as, um, as simple and concrete a way as possible. Try to make your facts even stickier than the myths that you're trying to debunk. So that's the first element to an effective debunking. The second is you do need to mention the myth when you're debunking it. You need to activate it in people's minds in order for them to tag it as false. But before you mention it, warn people that you're going to introduce them to a myth uh, so that they're cognitively on guard and so that when they hear the myth, they're less likely to believe it, they're less likely to be influenced by it or to think that it might be true. So providing a warning before mentioning the myth is important. And lastly, uh, you need to explain um, how the myth distorts the facts. If people have the fact and they have the myth, and these are conflicting pieces of information, you need to help them resolve that conflict between the two. And the way you do that is explain the fallacy or the denial technique in the myth. And uh, the framework um, of the five techniques of denial, flick, is a really powerful way of, of uh, helping find the, the different fallacies or denial techniques in misinformation. Uh, so let me give an example from um, from uh, some recent COVID-19 uh, misinformation. This was particularly prevalent in February and March. Um, once the number of um, deaths from COVID-19 surpassed uh, the 34,000 people who died uh, during the last flu season, this has become less um, prevalent, although I'm still hearing it. It's a very persistent myth. And the myth is that COVID-19 isn't as bad as the flu. And it was more convincing in February and March because at that time there were like, in February there were no deaths from, from COVID-19. And even in March there were, there were much less than 34,000. Uh, and the problem is because it was convincing back in the early stages, those early stages were crucial to when we needed to be aggressively adopting social distancing measures because we delayed those measures, that's what allowed the, uh, the virus to take hold in this country. Uh, and misinformation like this was, was being deployed by, by um, President Trump, by um, people on Fox News, just COVID-19 misinformation sources all, all across the map were using this argument. Uh, and it, it had a big impact in those crucial early stages. And by deconstructing the argument and looking at identifying the, the hidden uh, premises, um, we're able to see what, um, what this argument does wrong, how it distorts the facts. And it uses a form of cherry picking called slothful induction, which is coming to a conclusion without considering all the evidence. In this case, the important evidence is that COVID-19 is more infectious than the seasonal flu and it uh, has a much higher mortality rate, combine those two together. And even in those early stages, we had the expectation that the number of deaths from COVID-19 would accelerate and, and far surpass um, 
the, the deaths from the seasonal flu. And that's exactly what's happened over the last month. Now, how do you put this into practice? I've been taking this fact, myth, fallacy approach and applying it now to COVID-19 misinformation. So uh, we took the myth that COVID-19 is less dangerous than the flu, uh, identified the key fact, um, and then also explained the fallacy that the myth uses. And a, a powerful way that, um, uh, of explaining fallacies is using analogies. Um, usually we use analogies to explain science, uh, but analogies can also be really powerful in explaining bad logic. Uh, and so what I do is I take the bad logic in the myth and I find a parallel situation, usually the more absurd, the better in terms of explaining the bad logic. And I take that exact same logic and transplant it into the parallel situation. In the case of COVID-19 is less dangerous than the flu, it's not looking ahead to the, the dire impacts that are coming down the pipeline. And that, um, that fallacy is exactly the same as falling from a height and arguing that, hey, I feel fine. I haven't suffered any, um, any health impacts, uh, ignoring the fact that something bad is coming down the line. Uh, here's another example of a um, fact myth fallacy debunking that I put together. This was done just after um, they um, updated the COVID-19 projections, which were, I think they were estimating between 100,000 to 200,000 deaths, and then they downgraded it to 60,000. And the immediate response from the conservative media was, oh, the models have downgraded the numbers. Uh, COVID-19 must not be the big problem that they were saying it was. So we should relax social distancing. And uh, to, I, to explain the fallacy in this argument, I actually borrowed an, an analogy from Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who I hope is currently in hospital and is, is on the mend and is feeling well. I digress there. Uh, and she, um, she used this argument, and I, and I, I forget what the, the topic was, but the, the analogy was that, um, that if you, you hear that the forecast is for rain, and so you take an umbrella, but then you see that you're dry and you think, oh, I don't need my umbrella anymore, and you throw your umbrella away. The umbrella was what was keeping you dry. And so getting rid of it um, is, is obviously a, not a good idea. Uh, and then since then, I found an even more powerful analogy. Um, I said before that the more absurd the situation, the more powerful the uh, analogy and the explanation is. And that analogy, I should have put this in my slides, but um, in fact, I do have it earlier on. But uh, the analogy is that um, falling uh, with a parachute and arguing, well, the parachute slowed down my fall, so I don't need this parachute anymore. And taking it off mid-fall. Exactly the same logic as saying that we should relax our social distancing um, because the, the curve is flattening. Uh, and so I'll just finish off with this slide again. I'm uh, just repeating that if there's, if there's two ideas that I'd like you to take away from this, um, from this presentation, the first idea is fact myth fallacy, which is the structure of an effective debunking. And the second idea is flick, the five techniques of science denial. Um, and lastly, uh, if you want to follow up with more information, uh, I mean, I've been giving you links throughout this presentation and I can share the slides too, if, if that's helpful, Sam. Uh, but you can al always contact me at, uh, at crankyuncle.com slash contact. Uh, if you need uh, debunkings of climate misinformation, we debunk, um, oh, I don't know, about 150 odd myths on skepticalscience.com. And you can follow me on Twitter at John F. O. Cook. Thanks very much. Thanks, John. We have about nine minutes left. Should we, were there any questions? I know people were moderating the chat box. Were there any questions for John? Or does anyone who did not put a question in the chat box have a question now? I heard someone unmute themselves, I think. 
No, no questions. Well, oh. I do see a comment that oh. RBG is out of the hospital, so that's great. <laughs> so I'll, I'll ask a question. So this, this imbalance in the numbers that, you know, the, the, the six percent of people who are demonstrating versus the ninety-four percent of people who aren't is how can we get the press to report the imbalance in the numbers? Yeah, I mean that's I, I mean that's a real um, mainstream media problem because somebody quietly sitting on their couch is not quite the um, you know, it doesn't quite make as good television as, as these crazy people waving assault rifles around in a, in a state house. Um, uh, earlier I mentioned, actually I didn't mention it, but Sam mentioned about the 97% consensus. Uh, and like a lot of the climate communication research we've done at Mason has found that um, commuting so, communicating social information is really powerful because humans are social animals. That's why I, um, misinformation targeting the consensus is the most powerful form of climate misinformation. Uh, and so the flip side of that is communicating the scientific consensus on climate change is really powerful, but also communicating social consensus is also really powerful. So um, uh, I think like the, the Yale data have found that like 58% of the public are concerned or alarmed about climate change but most of them don't talk about the issue with their friends and family because they don't realize that, that the majority of the public are on board with climate change. So just communicating or debunking that misconception that, that public, the public aren't on board about climate change uh, is one very simple and easy thing to do to debunk the, the myth that um, the public aren't on board and um, help break climate silence. So I think communicating the social consensus, uh, just getting those very simple numbers out there. 94% of the public are on board with COVID-19. Like 80% of the public are on board with climate change. Get those out there and, and also, all, also get out that the trends are also increasing. The public are getting more concerned about climate change over time. Um, so I think just communicating those simple numbers and encouraging the, the media to, to include those numbers when they cover these issues is also important. I think our media coordinator had a suggestion. Avi, can I unmute you? Sure. Yeah, I just suggested write a letter to the editor, right? We can make our own news. So if you're seeing a story or an op-ed in your local paper, um, whether it's local or state level, um, that's talking about these um, I almost call them riots, but you know, the demonstrations, um, write about how you, your neighbors are staying home and then connected to those stats that you're amongst the 94%, um, that these guys are the outliers, that they're not representative of how the country is behaving and believing. Absolutely. Um, and it's just, it's so easy for us to forget um, because so many of us are interested in trusting our news that many of the institutions and estates that we looked to for so long have been captured. And so more independent, free reporting, more people powered, less profit centered news and information is critical. Um, our opposition know how impactful a narrative can be or a single idea. And if it's iterated enough and validated through certain sources, whether it's you know wrongfully validated, they understand the impact of that and how stories impact culture and culture shapes policy and action. And so definitely, um, we are always supporting folks in telling their story, whether it's our student activists or our faculty activists. And it starts with building relationships and helping to, again, like as John said, combat that information in our communities. Yeah. So I've got a passage from Steve Mursky's column in Scientific American that bears both on the Uncoke My Campus campaign about the YouTube algorithms and also on the phenomenon of conspiracy theories, which is part of what we're having to combat. So this is based on an interview he did with the director of the Good Thinking Society in the UK, a guy named Michael Marshall. Okay, so it starts out concerning flat earth videos and 
he goes on to say, YouTube's recommendation algorithm appears to have then amplified the signal by bringing flat earth info to the attention of fans of other questionable notions. So Marshall explained. So you'd be watching a video about moon landing denial and YouTube would say, I think someone who's a bit into moon landing denial might also be into the flat earth theory. And it would float it there as a suggestion. And if people clicked it, that solidified that link. End of quote. Flat earth belief, quirky and perhaps humorous on its own even, death thus became part of what Marshall called an ecosystem of conspiracy theory. So I, I just like Professor Cook's comment on that. What, what do we do about this ecosystem? Yeah, I mean, it's a real problem here is, <laughs> is the fact that our social media platforms, their financial model is, is based on these kind of dynamics. Like they make more money by delivering content that people click on. And usually the kind of content that people click on is the emotive stuff, it's the, it's the eye-catching stuff, or it's the content that confirms our beliefs. So they have a vested interest, social media platforms, in, in delivering, like keeping people in their echo chambers or, or just sort of you know, dragging them down these kind of rabbit holes. Uh, and so, I mean, I mean, there's a variety of solutions to that. Um, one is pressure on social media platforms. So if there is enough public pressure, then and they see that their financial model is threatened from a different direction, then that, that can cause them to, to moderate their algorithms. Um, another, uh, another approach is um, government regulation of c social media platforms. Uh, what I've been looking at is um, a, a different angle, and, and I think all these things happen, need to be happening at once, um, but uh, what I'm looking at is building public resilience. So uh, we need, like all the bells and whistles, all the technology is great, and we need to develop that, but ultimately we need to be working on the public to make them resilient against misinformation. And that, that's a, a difficult problem. Um, and I, I did have slides about that. And I, I, I figured I was going on too long, so I trimmed it. But, um, um, but yeah, I, I think d doing that through the classroom is, is the most effective way of, of building a resilient public. Absolutely. One way that UNCOKE engages um, in a tactic to help our constituents and volunteers is we definitely um, make it transparent and really obvious the private interests that are behind certain amounts of information. Once you delegitimize and you make it clear that this source is in relationship with this other really corrupt source and it's not actually for public transparency and education and for the you know betterment of our society. It's actually for a private, pretty, pretty nefarious um, motivation. That also helps our, our folks, our volunteers, really understand that, okay, we'll consider the source. If someone is you know, a goon for someone else, you know that they're operating um, with a certain kind of plan and interest in place. Was there another question, Sam, that we missed? Yeah, Dante asked the question, um, and after we answer it, I also want to give Dante the floor to say a few things. Um, but Dante is one of our amazing student organizers in our network. Um, Dante has been instrumental in organizing students of color around environmental work, not only in California, but across the country. And Dante's question is, what role can lived experience slash anecdotes play in debunking these myths. It's not common for a lot of us to point out fallacies and theories and use academic backing when talking colloquially with our community members, family, and friends. And so what's the value of storytelling in our movement? Yeah, so um, in my fact myth fallacy graphic, I had the principle fight sticky myths with stickier facts. We need to make our facts as sticky as possible and using anecdotes, using concrete examples is one really powerful way of taking what can be a really abstract statistical, um, you know, concept that we're trying to explain and make it concrete and, and real. So, so they, can, they can be really powerful. The important thing though is when you're using anecdotes that you don't fall into that cherry picking fallacy. And I distinguish between exemplars versus cherry picking. An exemplar is an example or an anecdote that is consistent with the, the big picture. Whereas cherry picking is when 
the example that you use um, it contradicts what you get when you look at the big picture. Uh, the other thing that I, I think is really powerful just in everyday conversations is analogies. Um, we were doing some research into using analogies and parallel arguments to um, explain bad logic. And we were debunking a myth about uh, gun control. Specifically, it was an argument that Marco Rubio again used at a, a town hall where he argued that, well, criminals don't follow laws, so what's the point in having gun laws? And um, the, the analogy we used was, um, well, criminals don't follow laws, so what's the point in, in having traffic lights? Um, they're not going to stop criminals from driving through them, so it's pointless having traffic lights, uh, which is obviously a, a ridiculous argument. But I was having an, a phone call with my dad, who's in Australia, um, which Australia doesn't have quite the same problem with gun control that the US has. But even then, my dad made that exact Marco Rubio argument. So I, I fresh from doing this experiment, just said, well, that's just like, um, you know, and use the traffic light analogy. And my dad was just like, for, for the first time, I think in my lifetime, was at a loss for words. He didn't know what to say to that. So I, that got me thinking, oh, wow. I mean, my data shows that, um, that this is an effective method, but seeing it work on my dad, that, you know, maybe there's actually something to this, which I know is anecdotal, but, but um, it kind of underscores my point, I guess. Awesome. And I also, Dante, if you're around, I wanted to give you the floor um, because you made a really important point about connecting all of this to decolonial and healing work. And I just wanted to give you the floor to elaborate a bit because I think our audience could really use that context. Yeah. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Dante. I use he, they pronouns. Um, thank you so much, John, for just like your presentation today. And thank you so much for also just really important uh, pointing out the fact that, you know, like these analogies, like we very much do need to make sure that we're also refining them and making sure that we do stay on mission and true to the point so that we're not engaging in biases as well, too. Um, <clears throat> I brought up that point just because um, you know, it is really important to acknowledge that, like, in a lot of our communities, um, especially like communities of color as well, too, is that uh, the power of the narrative, power of the story as well, too, you know, written word is not something that was uh, something brought up from our communities and from our ancestries, you know, this was something that was uh, you know, permeated by, like, white supremacy and imperialism. Um, and so, like, definitely using, like, the power of storytelling, I think, is really, really good, because not only uh, you know, acknowledging that this work is multi-scalar, you know, it needs to happen in our communities, it needs to happen in a person, it needs to happen, you know, on a national and international scale as well, too. Um, but I was just bringing up the fact of, like, stories and, like, maybe, like, working on, like, you had, like, best practices sheet, you know, working on, like, how do we have those, like, really hard conversations, because honestly, you know, I can yell at a stranger <laughs> pretty easy, because, like, I'm ready, and this is my belief, but, like, when I come back to my home, and, like, this is someone that I really love, and this is someone that I live with, and I know that I, I assume that we have the same values, because we live with each other, you know, having those, like, really hard conversations, the exact same conversations we have to have about anti-blackness, and the indigeneity, and stuff like that, and I was just going to give like my two cents on that. And I think that it is like really, really important to like look at the power of the narrative and like really understand and amplify the voices of like those who are actually like really, really getting affected and like making sure that like that collectivism is like really like, I think just like, I just stoked within like our analogies and like our, um, our storytelling within that. And then I also was uh, talking about, um, well, just one more point, I guess, on that one is that, like, also just, like, acknowledging that, like, lived experience and analogies very much is and should be held to the exact same standard um, as, like, academic journals and, like, very much all those other things, because, like, for some, for a lot of people, like, that experience is, like, all we have, you know, that is, like, what we hold our bread and butter, you know, that is our identity, that is how we shape our values and stuff. And um, the intersection of like decolonial and healing work, you know, really looking at like what you brought up in the very beginning, which was that individualism. And I really think that like individualism is one of like the greatest side effects of like white supremacy, capitalism, imperialism, you know, the whole nine yards is like, has caused us to fragment, you know, and not be trusting in our communities and not be trusting of other communities as well too. And so I was, I was really looking at that, you know, and really looking at healing because all of us, you know, whether we're coming from, uh, you know, colored communities or like where we're coming from white communities as well too, is that we, you know, very much also need to acknowledge that like we also have a lot of like patterns of behavior to shed and, you know, a lot of like inner reflection as well too to shed before we start debunking these myths because if I'm, you know, really, 
really, really dependent on my internalized capitalism and my internalized white supremacy that I have. And that's just because of colonialism you know, for a lot of us is that I have to make sure that I'm like not perpetuating the exact same stuff that I'm hoping to attack with this as well too. And then I really do think as well, you know, when we have our country's what, like 72% white, you know, like really also talking about um, getting to the core of white complacency as well too, um, in a lot of things and really attacking, you know, the root of white complacency in a lot of these instances, you know, there very much is that minority that we're, you know, you talked about John in the very beginning, but you know, where's all the white folks coming out, <laughs> you know, telling the rest of the white folks to get back in their houses. <laughs> you know, it, it's like, I, I think that like, we really do need to um, just look at like, that root of like what white complacency is and you know like also just like looking at me too like i'm mixed you know and i very much use that like my white peering skin uh to have those hard uh you know community checks as well too but looking more at like how can we foster community in like white communities and not only break down like individualism but simultaneously have these really hard conversations um and build more of a collectiveness towards this because you know i really do think that when people are coming out there you know i i really don't think that they I, you know, I really hope it's not just for stupid haircuts, but like, you know, I really just hope that it is because like they feel trapped and they don't feel like they're a part of a collective. And for a lot of those people, like it was, you know, going out into the market because of internalized capitalism, just how America was born, you know, it was going out and interacting with goods and services. And I, you know, not having that collection, not having that, you know, family to come home to or that community come home to is, you know, really, really hard for a lot of people. And like looking at that, you know, abandoned issues and trauma in terms of that and like how we can have those like exact same conversations like simultaneously to really like do some like critical work with that. Thank you, Dante, so much for bringing that to this, to this call. Um, I think we have one last question, which is, it kind of go, let me find it, because a lot of people like kind of ask the same question. Y'all are active. Okay. Um, there was... There are multiple conversations really in the realm of choosing our battles, right? So there, there were, there's a point made about if you're talking to someone that you would, you know, consider to be like on the alt-right or ultra-right and they're, you're trying to combat these myths with them and they don't care, they don't want to hear anything and they have no interest, it seems, to have their minds changed or have a dialogue about the conversation. Um, what would your recommendation be there? And then people followed up asking, you know, should we, should we spend our energy speaking to large rooms of people or is it worthy to, to spend time talking to our family and friends over dinner, even though it's a smaller audience? I think really the, the, the crux of the questions that people are getting at is where can we, where is our energy best spent? If you have a perspective on that, John. And before John answers, I'll jump in and just provide a little bit of a reframe. Um, it really is the programming and cultural um, edict of capitalism, white supremacy, and patriarchy to really look at our relationships with a cost benefit analysis and commodify one another and say, tell me where I should invest my energy, tell me where I should invest my time, and then um, to evaluate people as worthy of our time or worthy of our effort versus not. And that's really easy whenever we're in the majority power to then choose folks who we deem less than us, whether it's ideologically different, racial, ethnic, class differences. And so we really encourage, um, you know, and we practice this internally at Uncoke, that we don't commodify one another in that way, that we stay in community and principles struggle with each other, which means that it is my obligation to educate you. It is my obligation to make sure that people within my ecosystem, my, um, you know, I would say as an indigenous person in my tribe, as a black person, I would say like in my family and my extended community and my kinfolk, um, to uplift one another and really have those hard conversations. The other thing that we also do is we consider our audience. Um, if someone is not interested in having a conversation with you about this, we're not going to browbeat folks. We're not going to, you know, get on the attack. It's not, that is not a welcome um, relationship, right? Um, accountability is what this is based in. What John is teaching us is absolutely about accountability and transformation and you can't hold someone else accountable they have to be willing to be accountable and so these skills that we um are offering to everyone and that john was so brilliant with his presentation the, this goes to folks who are already in relationship with you and also whenever you want to be broadcasting um the truth that we know right which is around climate justice and racial justice and class justice so I'll, I'll 
push it over to John now with those uh, caveats. Thanks, Jasmine. And I, what I was going to say was pretty much uh, consistent with what you just said. Um, firstly, I think that I think there is um, use in engaging with even even the people who are dismissive of of science, uh, of climate science or COVID science. Um, but there's also a lot of research showing that people who are dismissive of science, efforts to communicate the facts to them. Um, can either be unproductive or even counterproductive. So, so recognizing that fact, um, the approach I typically take when I am engaging with people who are dismissive of, of science is to try to look at those exchanges as um, potentially educational opportunities or, or teachable moments um, and recognize that I actually have very little chance of changing that person's mind but I can have a positive benefit with everyone else who's watching the, the conversation. <coughs> so when I'm like giving a public talk and someone in the audience uh, starts throwing climate misinformation at me, um, I'll answer their questions uh, and I'm, at, I'm speaking to them, I'm engaging um, respectfully and politely to them, but I'm explaining the facts, I'm explaining how the mis misinformation distorts the facts for the benefit of everyone else in the room who's watching the exchange. And what that does is, well, firstly, if I'm not trying to, uh, if I recognize that I, I probably am not going to change their mind, it allows you to be a lot calmer when you're uh, engaging with people who are dismissive. And that, that calmness is actually really important because how you speak is just as important as, as what you say for, for an audience who's watching an exchange like that. So, um, so that's, that's the, the first um, thing. It's two other things. I might forget the third by the time I get to it. But the second thing I wanted to say was that um, thinking of those six Americas, um, and I'm a bit worried now because I don't know whether what I'm doing now is kind of that sort of commoditizing um, thing that Jasmine was just talking about. But I tend to think of them as like three audiences, uh, the dismissives, the undecided, and the concerned and alarmed. And uh, I think that you do need to recognize that different audiences uh, accept information in different ways and therefore you can uh, often have different goals depending on who your audience is and um, for me as a climate communicator these three audiences I think of uh, concerned and alarmed the goal is about activating them because most of them don't talk about the issue with their friends and family um, that, that uh, inoculating messages actually empower people to talk about it um, by understanding the, the kind of cranky uncle arguments that they might encounter, that um, gives them the confidence to be able to talk about that issue with their friends and family. So um, for the 58% of the US public who are concerned or alarmed about climate change, um, the goal is activating them. For the 30, um, 33 or so percent of the public who are um, undecided or disengaged, it's about getting them engaged, just getting them on board and moving them into the concerned and alarmed group. And so um, for me, one approach, just one amongst many tools that are available to us is using humor. Because humor is, um, has the biggest impact on people who are disengaged in terms of engaging them with a serious issue. So um, but there are lots of different ways that we, we can engage. And I think that conversations with our friends and family is one really powerful way of doing that. So the, to answer the question, do we concentrate on large groups or do we concentrate on small conversations? I think the answer is yes. Um, we need to, um, you know, do all of those and I think do what works best. Like we're all unique. We all bring different uh, tools and skills to the table. So, so take what you've got, and try to bring all of it, combine it in different ways. Like I'm kind of slightly above average on, on cartooning, critical thinking and, and psychology. So I've tried to combine all those in a unique kind of way to engage and reach as many people as possible. Um, but everyone else has different skills. So it's find what you've got and find out are you, if you're good with conversations, do get into those situations. If you're good at social media, reach out to lots of people and just explore your skills and your um, what, what you enjoy and, and try to Absolutely. use those um, to, to make the world a better place.
Yeah, and this is what we've been underscoring in each of our webinars, what we underscore in all of the resources and organizing that we do is that we need everyone within the ecosystem, right? We need the analytical science scientists who are providing data. We need the um, folks who are doing protest art. We need the comedians. We need the healers and doing joy work, right? They're, wherever we find ourselves in this constellation, as long as we're working in principled struggle with one another um, and united in our goals. Um, and we support the fact that we all approach this work in different ways. It, like we create this critical mass of change and transformation. Um, and it reflects those numbers that we saw that we actually are the majority. <laughs> we are not, um, you know, we, our numbers are larger and it's just about how we tell that story, how we show up in space and how we continue to be in relationship with one another. So thank you, John. We are really appreciative of you. And again, big fan of your comics and your work. And um, I would say that you're definitely more than above average on your, <laughs> <laughs> your skill set. Any other questions before we wrap up? And I pass it to Sam. Looks like we're good. Go for it, Sam. All right. Yeah, I'll just reiterate. Thank you, John. And thank you to everyone who joined us on this webinar. Um, I have put links in the chat box and we will send out a follow-up email as well. But on the note of demonstrating that we are the majority, I really want to reiterate Avi's point about writing op-eds about this and talking about your personal experiences and contextualizing it in that data John just gave us um, around the fact that we are the majority. And so if you want support on doing that locally to build our own public conversation, please email Avi um, at media at uncookmycampus.org. I put that in the chat box. And then we're also working to build um, public pressure and demonstrate that we are the majority around this issue and that many of us are aware of how much um, how the dark money organizations are behind this effort to promote these myths around COVID-19. So we do have a letter writing campaign where you can easily write your governor and expose, uh, basically use the, the research that we've talked about over the past three weeks. We summarize it into a nice little letter and you can automatically send that letter to your governor. And then that's the type of stuff that Avi can then also demonstrate. Like, yes, we're not as exciting and sexy as holding guns on state houses, but if we can have a mass mobilization of people flooding their governor's inboxes with these letters, that's also a media opportunity from your couch. Um, and then last but not least, we are working to hold YouTube accountable, as we discussed a little earlier, around their recommendation algorithm and how it's promoting climate denial videos and also monetizing climate denial videos. And so there's a link to our online action and petition to help us hold YouTube accountable as well. Um, so please take action. We will follow up with those links as well as all of the links to John's research and resources. And Mo posted links to our uh, social media. Please go follow us on social media. Definitely follow John on social media. I re highly recommend following John's Instagram um, and our Instagram. You can find John's Instagram through our Instagram because we share a lot of John's stuff. <laughs> Uh, but it's incredible. The, the cartoons that John creates are really useful, and I think people will get excited by them if you're sharing them. So thanks for joining us, everyone, and be on the lookout for follow-up emails and our next, next action. <laughs>